So I'm super excited to be here. I want to thank Rachel and the School of Law for having me out. And um, I'm here for in Berlin for like a super short amount of time. Like a, 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 a so fluid world tour. World went tour. I'm, I'm actually out in Europe for a Sonar Festival, so I'm going to go back to Sonar tomorrow. I had some installation in uh, Sonar, but I'm excited to come out. And Rachel was like, you have to come to Berlin. And, and now I'm here, and I'm excited. I'm really thrilled and honored to be here. And, I'm excited to talk to you about my work. Um, and the way I describe what I do, um, I really kind of split my time doing, I'm doing three things. I work as an artist, I do commercial work, and I work in education. And I'm really gonna, as I go through the talk today, I'm kind of gonna focus on each one of those three things at a different time. And I like to really try to divide my time evenly, and I think of those things almost as three legs of a stool, and they, um, I don't know, I, that's the way I work right now. Um, so first I'll start with a quick introduction I used to look like this. Um, <laughs> I studied fine arts, I studied painting and printmaking in New York at Hunter College, and um, I had to get a job. And at, at that time, everybody was talking about web design and Y2K, so this is a long time ago. <laughs> Who remembers Y2K? Some, some folks in the room. So people thought the world was gonna end when it, um, when it turned to the, the year 2000. Um, and uh, I bluffed my way into a job uh, doing uh, web design. And at that moment, what happened was the economy crashed and all of these companies went out of business and we had all this free time at work. And I discovered code. I discovered there was a tool called Flash. Who remembers Flash? So, most people here. So, um, so I started, I, what, I just, what I loved is that you could write, with ActionScript, you could write a line of code and make something move. And this was way back in the day, sort of Flash 4, like really tiny box programming. But the idea that you could say like x equals x plus 1 and make an object move across the screen, for me that was really magical and I've kind of dedicated my life to doing this uh, stuff since then. I do all kinds of projects. I'm going to kind of like blitz through, focus on some projects zoom out, talk about some current stuff, but like should just show sort of things I've been working on. This is a project from a long time ago. Um, this is a commercial project we did with Toyota. People, it's this small smart car. People think you can't drive them quickly. Like if you drive this car quickly, it's gonna tip over. But we wanted to show somebody driving this car really quickly. So we hired a stunt driver. We would put colored dots on the top of the car and hired a stunt driver to drive um, letters of the alphabet and made a font out of driving. So this font comes out of the act of driving. Um, this is a project that we did in New Zealand where most, it's a building projection and most building projections involve the building kind of falling apart and coming back together, sort of 3D effects. And we really want to use the body. So for this project, we captured people's silhouettes and amplified them and projected them on the building. And, you know, you came and then you became a monster sort of five stories tall. And if you grab somebody's hand, you got bigger. And, um, a lot of times I'm doing extremely random stuff. This is uh, my friend Daito. We worked together on some projects. And uh, we were hanging out in Belgrade at Resonate Festival, hacking on um, some software to, that tracks the face and um, projects on the face at the same time. So it tracks the movement of the face. And when he moves his eyebrows, these kind of balls fall down. And this must have been like 2 AM in um, this hotel lobby in Belgrade. And you can imagine what the people <laughs> in the hotel thought when they saw us. Um, this is a project from a long time ago, but it's kind of a good introduction to um, the, the stuff that I'm really interested in. This is, on the left, that's my um, partner, Golan Levin, who is my professor at Parsons. So after I went to Hunter and had this experience of like working in a design studio, I went to 
uh, Parsons, which is a de design school, and got my master's degree. And I studied with Golan Levin, and after I graduated, I started to work with him. And this is a project that we made, which combines an overhead projector, so the kind of uh, pro projector that your math professor would write notes on, and a digital projector, and combines them to create a kind of hybrid light source. So mixing both digital and analog lights. So um, I, we were, these early projects, like Goldman and I were traveling around kind of doing, um, uh, you know, these kind of uh, performances and installations. So we had, for example, a performance with two singers where we imagined what their voice would look like. And we were touring, doing this work sort of in the early 2000s. And um, we were writing C++ code. We were um, coding it, but we were using, it wasn't open source. The tools that we were using were developed at MIT in the media lab, but they weren't available for other people. And um, I, at that time I started teaching, I was teaching at Parsons, and I really <coughs> wanted to come back and share code with my students. And I wanted to, you know, really take the things that we were learning as artists and, and give them to students so that they can make work. Um, and so I helped develop a tool called Open Frameworks. This is my, I taught for 10 years at Parsons, that's what my ID card looks like. Mm -hmm. uh, developed this tool called Open Frameworks, which is basically a kind of toolkit of code, like um, to make things easier for creating stuff. And uh, the project that I love, like, is Chris in the room? <laughs> so I always show this project, so I feel embarrassed to show her work while um, she's here. But Chris was actually one of my students at Parsons, who um, who was like really one of the first people to try Open Frameworks and. Um, had a lot of input in, into it and helped out a lot with it. Um, but this project that she made, um, I think several years after she studied with me, is like, I think, my f by far my favorite open frameworks project ever. So I feel quite embarrassed to be talking about <laughs> some of her work. Um, uh, but this project's called Delicate Boundaries, and um, what it, the way this project works is there are um, these bugs on a computer screen, and when you put your hand up next to the computer screen, the bugs actually come off the screen onto your hand. And it's like, it's really profound. We always talk about artwork leaving the screen and it's really a, a profound statement about that. You know, this, that you really can see these creatures kind of exit the screen and come onto your hand. ask Chris about it. it. For me, it's like really, um, I think it's, it's uh, we, you know, we, it is a perfect embodiment of what it means to leave the screen. And I think open frameworks projects were really about that, like trying to create, trying to use computer vision, trying to use sensors, trying to use, um, you know, different ways of creating artwork that gets out of a computer screen and into physical space and into kind of using, using the body and, and uh, augmenting, extending the body. Um, I love drawing tools, and um, one of the things, so I love drawing, and one of the things that frustrated me immensely when I started using computers is how terrible it is to draw with a computer. So if you are, you know, trained in the arts, and you kind of use paint, paintbrush and ink and, um, you know, charcoal and all these sort of physical materials or paper, you know, once you start using a computer, it's, it, it's really hard. It doesn't have the same feel of those, um, of those materials, and you know, you use Illustrator or Photoshop. It does. It just doesn't feel real. It doesn't feel right. And um, a lot of the work that I did in um, sort of my kind of early days were exploring drawing and use, and really thinking about building drawing tools. So I'm going to walk you through some of these. Then I'm going to jump to some recent stuff. Uh, but this is a project that I made kind of early on called Drawn. 
Um, the idea behind this project that I'd be on stage painting and the audience can see what I'm painting behind me. Um, so I'm sort of on, there's a camera pointing down at a piece of paper and I'm drawing with ink. And this project's inspired by Thomas Edison and John Stuart Blackton. This is a film from 1905 called The Enchanted Drawing. And here you can see the illusion of um, drawings coming off of a piece of paper. <coughs> or uh, Port this Portuguese artist Helena Almeida, and Helena Almeida would take black and white photographs and augment them with blue paint. So here she paints a blue dot, she picks it up, she eats it, and she cries blue tears. And I love this idea of paint as something physical, as something you could touch. So I made this performance where I'm on stage painting, and then I can touch the painting. <laughs> I don't know what she's saying. I'm <laughs> hope <laughs> And we were touring, I was touring in Japan with this uh, Japanese musician, Pardon Kimura, and after the performance, everybody would come up, they would want to try, you know, you, there would be this like ma massive crowd that wants to try it or see how it works, because in a way it's like a magic trick. And so I decided to make a version for people to try themselves. So this is a, um, I made an installation where you could come and paint and then see your painting kind of come to life and uh, fast forward through this, but you can see like people could come and make a drawing and interact with it. And there's something that I got quite excited about when I watched people use this project. Um, I call it the, the open up mouth phenomenon. My friend Evan Roth calls this the holy fuck moment, but I call it the open mouth phenomenon. So I want you to pay attention to this girl. Um, this is number one, number two, number three, number four. Um, for me, like, this is what I'm interested in as an artist. Like, these moments I'm, I'm interested in. And I would make the argument that an open mouth is a, a pathway to somebody's heart. It's a way to reach people. Um, and uh, I'm gonna, uh, yeah, I will talk, this is another project that Chris was involved with, so I feel like you know, Chris should be on stage with me. Um, this is a project called the iWriter, which I, means a lot to me, so I will, um, uh, I will quickly just describe it. Um, Theo, Chris, and I, <laughs> <laughs> so Chris, uh, who's in the back of the room, um, Theo and I uh, help work and develop open frameworks, and, um, and the three of us teamed with two other artists, Evan Roth, who just moved to Berlin, I guess, I just heard, and uh, James Potterly from the Graffiti Research Lab. And the five of us collaborated with a sixth artist named Temps. Temps is an old school artist in LA, and he, um, he, over a decade ago, he was walking down the street and fell over and was diagnosed with a disease called ALS. So that in America, we call this Lou Gehrig's disease. I don't know if you have a name for it here, but it's a disease which attacks your muscles. And so he's completely paralyzed. He is on a machine that helps him breathe. And we didn't really have a plan for this project, but this couple that um, was involved in a fundraiser for him invited us out to come and meet him. And we just went out there to sort of show him our kind of media art, what we do. We got to know him and his family and his caregivers. Um, and when we went out there, he had uh, this commercial eye tracking system. So he says, dude, my hardware is ghetto. Uh, this is basically like a speak, a speak and spell. It tracks his eye movements. He can write messages with it. And he can, it kind of, with the computer voice, talk for him. Um, but he couldn't do what he loved. He couldn't draw graffiti with it. And he could also be saying, dude, my hardware is expensive. Because these devices are between five and $10,000. And there was a long period of time where he didn't have a device like this. He was just using an interpreter who would point at a piece of paper, and when they got to the right letter, he would signal with his eye movement. And so, um, when, we were, in the special unit. When, when we went out there, um, we re really didn't know um, what to expect, but we, we, Tony was so, um, it was really full of li life and energy and, and enthusiasm, and was, we really just got, went out there to get to know him um, and, and kind of understand and see if there's anything that we could do.
moving part of his body. Uh, and so, but however, his brain is wide awake and he is full of ideas and full of creativity. And uh, so it's uh, fortunate that you guys have introduced you to a lot of this fun type. And what we tried to do is learn as much as we could about eye tracking. Um, and just uh, like say like if we could use computer vision, could we track the movement of the eye? Could we understand, you know, um, also hack his system. So take this commercial system and figure out how to get our software running on it and use that as a way of understanding eye tracking a bit better. Um, and we developed an open source, open hardware kit. So we published all the instructions on Instructables and the source code um, for this kind of eye tracking system. So typical eye tracking systems are you know, thousands of dollars, but we published instructions for like, if you want to take a webcam and some IR lights and, you know, some sunglasses, this is how you could do it, kind of make an eye tracking system. We focus on the hardware and the software. Um, and we also really, I think one of the most important parts is we focused on um, Ted. And in particular, we designed software specifically for him, for his style and his, um, love of letter forms that we were really like thinking about how can we create software for him most people when you think about software you think about like microsoft word or photoshop and it makes software for millions of people but this is like software for an individual and i think that's that's interesting um, to consider and this is him using the system and in order to draw it's a bit like um, using illustrator the pen tool in illustrator so if you look long enough at the screen it's like clicking um, the pen tool and from those points you can make more lines from those lines you can make letters and once we had a system for him to draw um, words so here he is using the system you can see this is sped up a system for uh, for him to draw words we we're thinking what is the next step and the next step was to go outside and project his drawings live so we had to develop a technology which we call GML graffiti markup language where we communicate <coughs> the graffiti that he's drawing over XML over the internet and then somewhere else we're out in LA we don't have permission from anybody um, we are projecting the drawings live and then streaming that back into the hospital so um, if the uh, cops come, we have to pack up and move kind of quickly, but um, no, you know, don't ask for permission. Here's a really early version of the software. It was more like Photoshop than Illustrator, but you can see he has like, he had like a ton of style, even just with this very simple eye movements. Um, the right, his writers um, that like used to write with him were like freaking out about his seeing his style through his eye movements. And what was amazing is that when we did these events, they became like parties, like for his family um, and friends, that it was, it was really like a kind of celebration. I know this, um, for, for us, this project was really uh, exciting to work on, that he would be in the hospital room and we could project his drawings, um, you know. And um, what's amazing is that he, you know, we built this software for him and uh, he said it's the first time I've drawn anything since 2003. It feels like taking a breath after being held underwater for five minutes. And he, when he started, he was doing quite primitive drawings and his drawings got better and better um, using this eye tracking system that can't even make, imagine making with my hands, but he's making with his eyes. And we started taking the drawings everywhere we could to exhibits, really like around the world. This is our dream. If you know anybody with a lot of money, <laughs> oh, so oh, this you should see this video. <laughs> skip ahead a little bit but probably my favorite image is this kid um, the couple that invited us out to LA to work on this project their son made a version of the eye writer out of toys he was hanging out with us and I just love this um, picture because I suggest a few things one is the power of art to inspire the next generation but also I think a lot about this idea that art 
that there are problems in the world that governments are not going to solve and companies are not going to solve, but artists and people hacking and collaborating and working together can try to solve. Um, I love building drawing tools. So this is a, uh, I'm going to kind of just show some random, um, keep kind of focusing on drawing, then I'm going to jump ahead. Um, this is a project that I did with uh, Google, um, where they were like really commissioned artists to do creative stuff with Android. And this is a drawing tool. Um, the way this drawing tool works is you make a drawing and when you rotate the phone, the drawing rotates um, so that it's a bit like a 3D drawing tool. So you have a flat canvas, but as you rotate the phone, you can rotate the drawing. tools is people start to use them in really interesting ways. So people, a lot of times people will just sort of play or do sort of childish things. Um, mostly I love this. People will always do this. Um, <laughs> I, I always, I always, always, always forget to remove this slide when I talk to kids and then, yeah. So. Uh, but my favorite is this, this woman in um, South Korea drew this bird that I can't even imagine, I don't even know how she did it. Like I can't imagine how she drew this thing. But I love putting tools out there and seeing what people do with them. Um, this is another uh, project that I did with Google. Google um, came to me and they said, we have all the satellite photographs. Could you design a sort of intuitive or a, a kind of experimental way of navigating them, of exploring them? So I created this project called Landlines. And the basic idea is that you draw um, and you draw like a, a curve and it finds that curve in a satellite photograph. So if you draw like a straight line, it'll find a straight line. If you draw, you know, a letter of the alphabet, it'll find that. Um, uh, when I put this, this got on the front page of Reddit, and people were trying to draw penises. That was like, that's almost like, like a competition. Like, you, the internet is crazy. So. <laughs> but you draw, uh, you can draw, um, you know, a shape, and it will find, try to match that shape somewhere in the world. And a project like this, like there's m money components. A lot of times, the work that I do ha involves both the sort of like data sciencey side and then a kind of visual side. So a lot of times, I'm doing this sort of stuff, like just trying to figure out if I draw a shape, what are shapes that look like it, how can I do the matching, how you know what are the metrics that I can use, and really thinking about sort of data, but then also thinking about visuals. So the second part of this project is finding lines in, in these satellite photographs and connecting them to make a kind of infinite line. So as you drag, it finds coastlines and it'll connect like a coastline with a highway, with a river. It'll just find dominant lines and images and create a kind of endless line. So as you drag, these satellite photographs just get sort of montaged on top of each other. And the crazy thing about this is that these are real places in the world. So you could click on one of these links and it'll you know, take you to the, the, that part of the, the map in Google Earth. And you, when we were using this project, like I would see places like in Syria, like, you know, there were, there were um, parts of the world that were really interesting that this project kind of connected. And I, li I really like projects that are about engaging or kind of connecting or trying to understand the world. The next project sort of plays, um, plays to that. This is a, a project that I did several years ago. Um, really inspired by radio. So I love, um, in, in New York in particular, like you jump into a taxi and you hear, um, you hear the radio and it's like, it's always music from some place. Like you hear, you jump into a taxi and you hear like, you know, a foreign language or you hear, you know, some kind of music from Ghana or some interesting kind of sounds. And I love radio. I think of radio as an interesting way of sort of eavesdropping on culture. That if you have, like, if you sort of scan the dial on a radio, you can kind of pick up on different cultures. Um, and I also love this. Who remembers this? <laughs> so, I fucking love this thing. Um, this is like, we take this for granted. Um, those of you, do you want to come in? There's some, I'm sure you could come. Yeah, I think we can squeeze in yeah. the front here. Yeah. Some yeah. Um, Sorry, who, who remembers this thing? Okay, 
So I we take this for granted, right? That we have live streaming everywhere. We're like on Skype all the time talking to people. But the idea that you this for me this was magical. The idea that you could put in a URL and listen to some radio station somewhere in the world like this, this was this idea was really magical to me. Um, and so I decided to create this project where I would um, listen to radio stations around the world and write software that just listens to them and essentially build an instrument so that if you press a note on the keyboard, it finds that note somewhere in the world. It finds, <laughs> like if you press a C, you know, it'll find that note C somewhere playing in some radio station from around the world. So uh, when I do these projects, I always start doing a lot of research, really trying to figure out like, how can I detect what's happening in the audio and how can I learn about sound and like radio and, um, you know, and, and kind of co the culture, like even just learning about the history of MP3 format. Um, and then I do a lot of like data. So, uh, there's no, there's no like one source for um, URLs for web radio. So I did a lot of scraping, reverse engineering, a lot of stuff I didn't have permission to be looking at, um, finding, you know, scraping um, websites, etc. Trying to get a database of URLs from around the world. Um, and then I did a lot of listening to those that audio and really trying to figure out like how to how to isolate parts of the audio that sound like a musical note. Um, I think this is, I love, actually this project I just listened to so much cool, weird music. Um, I, and then I wrote, so I did I didn't like, <laughs> wasn't like really smart. I basically made like a single open frameworks app that listens to a single radio station. And whenever it finds a, something that sounds like a musical note, it kind of records it and chucks it off to the app. So it's basically like, you can imagine all of these things are just listening. They're all listening to a different radio station, and then they're just saying like, I found a note, here you go, I found a note, here you go, and this is what my doc looked like, it was crazy. Um, <laughs> and the, um, I can show you what this musical notes sound like. Um, so the, oh, a couple things to say is that you, you don't need to hear the note for a long time to understand the context. So I'm gonna play a sound for you, like really short. You don't need to hear the whole song to understand the context of the sound. So t take a listen. Right, you don't need to hear like a, a lot of the audio to understand something about the context. To me, that's, that's an interesting idea. Um, and so I'm gonna play for you what this instrument sounds like. It was really cacophonous, so um, here, here's what it sounded like. <laughs> really coming from places around the world. <laughs> and when I was working on this project, it was around the time of the World Cup, so every once in a while I would get notes that were like this. <laughs> Um, the way we, the way this project worked is that we had 12 speakers and we put them in the round. We had um, kind of like uh, hung them from the ceiling. And um, the idea is that you would hear the sound from the direction in the world that it was coming from. So if the sound was coming from Asia, you might hear it from over here. From, if it was coming from Africa or South America, you might, you would hear it from directionally where in the world the sound was coming from. Because I think a lot of times we're not really aware of where we are in the world. Right, we, you wouldn't think if I said like point to Japan, you know, we didn't know, you'd have to think about it, right? You'd have to sort of orient yourself, understand what direction you're at and kind of know, okay, Japan is this way. And I really wanted people to feel like some connection when they're using this project, that their sound is somewhere out there in the world. Um, and a lot of the stuff I do in the studio involves hacking, like taking apart equipment. This, Marcella is awesome. He's the, we were just discussing her um, earlier today. Taking apart equipment, um, <laughs> hacking uh, you know devices figuring out how to express um, and, uh, and communicate this idea so um, audio yeah, projects are like all around the world this is me saying exactly what I just said to you. <laughs> um, audio projects are impossible to document like really impossible so I don't know how I, it's hard for me to show this to you because um, kids are really like it. Here's 
what it kind of felt like to play it. And the cool thing is that you could walk up to any speaker and you would hear you could hear where the sound was coming from or see what read it. Right? but it was pretty fun and awesome. This guy, I really like this guy came to play the instrument and he was like, I need this in my life. And that was, <laughs> I think that was like the best compliment you could get. Um, so, uh, so I taught for um, 10 years at Parsons and five years ago, some friends and I got really tired of the university system and we decided to start our own school, the School for Poetic Computation. And actually the first class that we had, Rachel was uh, a member of, so, um, so I'm excited to be here um, and see the school that she's running here. It's a very like kind of, we feel like we're sort of um, sister schools in some way or con connected, spiritually connected. So the School for Poetic Computation is based in New York. We've been running for five, we're approaching our fifth anniversary now. Um, really wanted to focus on poetry so most people, when you describe what we do, they talk about creative coding. That's the term. You say, like, I'm a creative coder. And that's a weird word, or a weird term. I think it's weird because um, I, I don't feel like it's sort of saying, like, other types of coding are not creative. And then it's also, I think the word creative is used really poorly now. If you see, like, people talking about creative class or creative city, like, it's just, a, it's just an odd term. And then it also celebrates coding, but actually we wanna celebrate poetry, the act of making work which is poetic. And in the tech world, there's this concept of sort of demos, like how, who's heard the term demo or die? This is like MIT, do you know what I'm talking about? Like some, nah, so there's a term of like making demos, like you have to demo, always make demos all the time. The thing about the word demo is that it very easily becomes the word poem, um, so. We like, we really want, we want to focus on poetry, not on demos. Um, and when we started the school, we were inspired by different people. Red Burns um, helped create the um, ITP program in New York, which some folks in here went to. Um, and uh, Red Burns was a documentary filmmaker, and she was really passionate about the power of technology but to use to tell stories and to make art. And uh, when she passed away, they had a funeral for her. They gave everybody fortune cookies. She had all these great things that she said to students. And the one that I got said that poetry drives you, not hardware. And I just love this idea of like celebrating poetry, that you would be invested in poetry, not, not software, not hardware. Um, and Carol Becker, who's the dean of the art school at, at Columbia, she used to be the dean of the art school at the School of Art Institute, Chicago. And she writes really elegantly about arts education. So she, is makes really passionate argument that artists should be at the table when decisions are being made. That not to like represent artists, but that being trained in the arts can help you make better decisions. We were um, also excited, like if you go to the bookstore, poetry is always the back of the bookstore. It's never in the front. It's always a single shelf in the back of the bookstore. And, but like nobody's getting rich writing poems, but it's these are like, you know, beautiful expressions of what it means to be human and what it means to be alive, and that's what we want to celebrate in our school. Um, we do this program in, uh, in New York. We have a 10-week program where people come from all over the world to learn electronics code and theory. And with electronics, we start from the ground up. People are learning circuitry, and then from that, learning how to do, you know, build half adders and adders and logic, and learning, like, computation. What is computation? What does computation feel like before digging into microcontrollers. Um, we do a lot of, look. <laughs> it's like yesterday. It's um, It's like a weird, I'm hearing this talk and everybody's in the room. Um, uh, and, uh, and we do a lot of like hanging out and, and building stuff. There's a lot of cooking. Um, there's a lot of uh, drinking wine together. Um, I teach this class called Recreating the Past and it's inspired by this book, um, that I love called The Art of Computer Designing. So I'm just gonna quickly find this book. Um, it, this book is amazing. I fell in love with this book first, first off just because of the graphics, and I was like, what is this thing? This book is from the mid 90s, and it's all about you, how you can use the computer to do like interesting, cool designs. And I love this, I'm like addicted to like 1990s um, 
graphics and Japanese poster design and all this this kind of visual language. I was like, what the fuck is this? So cool. Um, but then there's this thing in this book, in the afterword of this book, um, where the author, Osama Sato, is writing this, um, this afterword. And he said, I would like to acknowledge my favorites, the Russian avant-garde, futurism and Bauhaus, who's brilliant. Typefaces and designs have in many ways shaped my own mind. If the artists of those movements were alive now to work with computers, I'm certain that they would discover new artistic possibilities. The work of past ages accumulates and is remade again. In this one sentence, I love this sentence so much. The work of past ages accumulates and is remade again. The idea there is that the past is there to be remade. And I think this is like both, um, this is both a gift and a, and a, um, and an obligation for students, for, for the students, to say that, that the gift is that the past is there. The past is there to be recreated in their voice, in, the, in their, you know, using the tools, using their voice, using what they're excited about. Um, and that the past is there, it's also an obligation that we should engage with the past and study the past. And so I teach this class called Recreating the Past, and the idea in this class is every week I talk about a different artist. So for example, Mira Cooper, who helped create the MIT Media Lab, and her vid she started the visual language workshop. They were doing some of the earliest work with typography and computation, thinking about what does it mean to have um, type in 3D, having transparency, having layers, like a lot of stuff we take for granted, they were exploring what that felt like. Um, and a lot of her work is really this kind of early intersection of design and computation culture. So uh, the Students look at her work and then they recreate her work. Or Vera Molnar is a Hungarian artist and she uh, lives in Paris now, but since the 70s she was writing code to control a pen plotter. So she's writing algorithms to make drawings and the students would study her work. And their homework assignment is really simple, to take one of her pieces and recreate it using modern tools. And, um, and I love this kind of thing, so they would, they would code it, then we'd have a conversation about the recreation. Um, or John Maida, he's got these more Sawa posters that, you know, the students would take one of those posters and recreate that. We wanted to show this in an installation. We were invited by a festival. We, what we suggested is to show the code and the visual side by side. So usually when you see art that's created with code, you don't see the code. Um, and we wanted to show them really kind of simultaneously that you could see the, um, the text and the visuals. Not the full text, but you could see the most important parts of the text. And the idea is that when some line of code would change, you could see a corresponding change in the visuals. I told the students that they should wear sunglasses. They did not believe me. We got LED screens. The AV company kept turning the brightness down. I kept turning the brightness up. Um, I really wanted it to feel like this. Um, that's like, I love LED screens. Uh, but it was like a film festival for code. Um, I can show you what this felt like. Are, these are works that the students made based on these artists. We also made a zine, like a, a zine you could take home where you could learn about the artists that, that we had um, uh, studied. See what it feels like when some number changes in the code, you can see the corresponding change in the visuals. And I got so inspired, my students made like, they made like 50 or 60 sketches, and I got really inspired when I saw them, like they just love making these kind of small sketches, that I started doing my own sketching, and I'll kind of walk you through that process. Um, so for about two and a half years now, I've been doing daily sketches. I want to show you like one sort of starting point, and then I'll walk you through kind of how I do the sketches. Um, I, I had a student that uh, earlier, maybe a couple years earlier, who had, for his final project, he did a book, um, Yuki Yoshida did a book of uh, drawing the code that you would use to draw a circle. There's actually many different algorithms that you can use to tell a computer to draw a circle. So he made a magazine where he collected these and he showed all, all the code and the visuals side by side. And I thought of an idea for him 
which was, um, I explained it in an email, then I got so excited that I coded it and I sent him the code. The basic idea is that you start with a rectangle and you pick a random point from one of the four sides mm -hmm. and then take a random point from one of the three other sides. And if that line intersects the circle, you don't draw it. But if it doesn't intersect the circle, you draw it. So the more lines you draw, the closer you get to sort of approximating the circle. And so you start drawing hundreds, thousands of lines, and you start seeing a circle out of that. And I got so excited about that that I tried, I said, okay, let's try letters of the alphabet. I tried the word love, that didn't work very well. I tried a smiley face, that did not work very well. Uh, but then I was like, what if those rays of, of, those lines were like rays of light, and what if they could bounce, and maybe I could get them kind of bouncing in there, inside of the letter forms. So I started to figure out like, how does light, how could I do reflection? How does light move? How would those lines move if they were rays of light? Um, and the first algorithms were kind of terrible, but really just thinking like, how could I have um, lines bouncing off these letter forms or refracting? If the line hits the letter form, it bends. Um, and did a bunch of sketches. I created this interaction, um, this interactive version where basically it's a light table um, and you come to it, you can put down acrylic shapes, and the software is simulating how light would bounce off of those shapes. is they're very physical. It starts with your body. Like you come, you put your hands down, you see your hands, you see that it's your body. Uh, but it goes from your body to your mind and back to your body. Like there's a process of sort of body, mind, body that you can really watch. By the end, like I love this. People stop, I, cut, I like work so hard on these acrylic shapes. By the end, people are just like using their hands or like putting their head down on the, um, on the light table. Like people who really understood it in a different way than I, that I did. But I just love these kind of projects that are, um, in a way, it's like my sketchbook and then inviting people to come and kind of play and experiment with the sketches. Um, so I, as I mentioned, I started this process of doing daily sketches. So on Instagram, I post um, sketches, basically a kind of like tiny poems every day where I write software. These are like little um, animations, little poems uh, where um, I express myself uh, daily. I got so excited about what the students were doing that I um, wanted to do that myself. Um, and a few things that inspired me, um, there's this 10 rules for students. These are popularized by John Cage, but they're written by Sister Karita Kent. And um, I love these, these are great. We put them on the wall um, at the SFPC. But I love rule seven, the only rule is work. If you work, it will lead to something. Um, and I love this, I saw this kid on the subway. He was wearing, um, or he had a, a phone, a camera, and he had the snap spectacles. So I just like, it freaked out when I saw this. And I took out my phone to take a picture of him. And was like, there's so many cameras at this exact moment. Like this moment is really wonderful. But I think artists need to be like this, like need to be documenting every single thing that you do. And I am like pretty crazy. I have this one folder um, on my hard drive. Um, it's called Every Day. Let me see if I can find this for you. Uh, documents, um, Every Day. Um, and pretty much every, you can see all of my uh, videos are called AAAA. Um, I have a really great naming scheme. But pretty much like everything I do, all the screenshots go in here, um, all the videos, and this folder is like, Killing me, it's like uh, almost three <laughs> um, But it's uh, it's important to document everything and try to share as much as you can. Um, another thing that I'm inspired by is a, this thing called ADI. It's it's really based on this um, movie. A B C A always B B C closing always be closing always. <laughs> Be closing. But for me, it's ABI, and that means, um, that stands for always be iterating. Um, and really, I feel like most people, when they think about creativity and making things, you'd say like, okay, I'm gonna start with a blank canvas, or I'm gonna start with, I'm gonna start with a blank piece of paper and start writing. But actually, what I try to do when I'm sketching is just iterate, and just take something that I've done and say like, what is the minimal, what's a minimal change that I can do to make something new? How can I change? How, really focusing on changing. 
Um, I think this picture really adequately um, describes it. So this kid had to write, I will make better choices over and over again. And you can tell by the end, they were like, they dropped a single line for the L, right? They like have optimized, this kid's, kid's genius. They have optimized so well. Um, and I think that's, that is important. If you have to do something over and over again, you will develop shortcuts. And as an artist, those shortcuts actually become your style. That the shortcuts that you take in order to make the work, the shortcuts that you take in order to do something new with what you've done, that becomes your style. So I started sketching just like focusing on reflection. I did all of these black and white sketches, um, a little bit of color, um, and I was showing them every day. I would kind of like code. They start. I started doing it, my uh, stepdaughter, who was um, six at the time. She was having trouble sleeping by by herself. So I'd come into her room and like read a book with her, and then I would hang out with my laptop and code a sketch. In the morning, I show it to her. And every, at the beginning, she's like, "Oh, that's amazing! So cool! I'm hypnotized." But like a month in, two months in, she's like, "That's it's getting a little boring." She's like, "Good no, no bad color." Um, so I was like, okay, next day, I like, I'm gonna do blobs. And I was like, I'm gonna change it up and just say like, okay, I have these blobby forms, how are they moving? What do they look like? Um, and sometimes you do stuff like, this sketch I made really quickly, and I, I did it because I tried something else, it didn't work, and I, I was like, okay, let me put two blobs together, see how they connect. And I didn't think anything of this, but people like this a lot more than than I did. Like, I put it out there and people really liked it, and I, I didn't really like it myself. And for me, that was really interesting. And I learned a lot as an artist putting stuff out there, seeing stuff that I like that other people don't like, or stuff that um, I don't like that much, but other people like. To me, that's really interesting. Those are data points, and I don't think it's necessarily that you want to be optimizing for likes or trying to make things that please everybody. But understanding how your, your ideas are in harmony and out of harmony with the world is really beautiful. That learning that's really um, unique. I made this, uh, my stepdaughter hated it, I loved it. Um, oftentimes inspired by different designers, so Lance Wyman has this Mexico 68 lo uh, logo, Olympics logo, which I loved. Um, and I said, okay, how can I take that, those like offset curves, how can I code them? And I just like went, went got lost with offset curves and thinking about how curves can interact with each other. Um, blobs, I do a lot of blob shapes, um, blobs on blobs. Um, I really like stuff like this, which is kind of 2D, sorry, 3D that feels like 2D, or 2D that feels like 3D. I think there's something really powerful in graphical forms that are a little bit ambiguous, images that are ambiguous that ask your brain to do some work. So for me, I try to um, create um, a lot of like 3D stuff that feels really flat. Um, oftentimes the, the sketches are like diary entries, so after uh, Trump was elected, it was like sort of after the election and before the New Year's, I had this weird feeling of being kind of happy and sad, like happy about the New Year and sad about the results of this election. So I was trying to express that weird feeling of like being happy, sad, and this is how I came up with it. Or um, after the inauguration, we felt like we were protesting every weekend, and I we were out in... Um, we went out to like JFK uh, and like, you know, we're out, my wife and I are like out protesting, like Women's March. It was like pretty much every weekend for like uh, weeks. Um, and so I made this sketch that was trying to show what it felt like to be pushing and like kind of fighting um, and, and pushing with other people. And that sketch really came out of that. Um, sometimes they're really like personal, like after the anniversary of my father's passing away, I wasn't sure how to respond to it. And I found this motion capture data of a single person walking which to me kind of felt like how I felt, it, it kind of captured how I felt alone, and then I did all this iteration and tried to like explode it out or draw it, but it was that movement that felt very personal. It's my way of, of recognizing that moment. Sometimes they're just random, like I find this um, video clip of a lot hand drawing a line and try to like use it um, to sketch with, often not very graphical, just taking curves as a starting point, circles. Um, circular forms, like this is just taking half circles and connecting them with straight lines, then trying to extrude them off in kind of a sort of quasi 3D. Um, oftentimes they're like uh, uh, responses to coming face to face with artwork, which really moves me. So for example, I went to the MoMA and saw these sculptures that Ruth Asala made, these like beautiful wire sculptures. And then I, I didn't like, I wasn't trying to recreate that work, but I was just trying to capture that feeling of like a circle in space expanding and contracting. 
and just try to take that, some idea or something that inspires me and put that into the sketch. Um, did a lot of sketches with typography. Um, oh, it's, oh, man. I can talk about sketches forever. Uh, <laughs> sorry. It's the, uh, all right. Uh, I'll do a few typography. Um, so I, uh, one thing I tried to do is make the blobs turn into type. This was really hard. Um, I spent a lot of time on this, trying to take the blob and say, like, be an F, be an F. And I'd say, like, now be a G, and like tell the blob, like, give it energy to say, like, be a G, um, or like, be an H, and it's like, I don't know what to do. <laughs> I'm not be an H. But I want to have it, I'm like, I don't even know what to do with it once I did it. I was like, I got it to work, and I was like, what did I do that all that work for? <laughs> but in a way, it's like, I feel like there's something about this kind of ex exploration that's like really like almost sort of coding your way towards different graphic design styles. Like Wes Wilson had these beautiful posters that he would do in the 70s for the you know, Grateful Dead, and it was like, in a way, sort of trying to code that. Um, and once I had this sort of blobby shape, I was thinking like, what could I do? How could I touch it um, and um, interact with it? And like, then, you know, I always am like, okay, could I put my, could I really, you know, hook it up to a webcam, and then, like, it was so surprising. I'm using my fingers, I'm staring at the computer screen, but it really felt like I was torturing this, it felt like I'm touching this, like, letter, like, it was really, um, yeah, kind of torturing the number three. Um, I uh, am a, kind of obsessed with the body. Um, Oscar, Sch how many of you are familiar with Oscar Schlemmer? This is, like, Dada. Um, these, actually, if you go to Giphy, uh, there's many Oscar Schlemmer gifts, and this is really odd. If you want to like up your gift game, Oscar Schlemmer, Dada, um, uh, these sort of Dada uh, um, ballets, like these gifts are amazing. You can like respond to emails and like, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> shit up with these gifts. Um, or like Louis Bourgeois, like extending the body, um, Nick Cave, these sound suits. Uh, I started doing these sketches like just taking the body as a starting point and thinking about what happens if you take the human form and rotate it, revolve it, extrude it, um, lots of experiments along this way, like where, where do you see motion, where you still see a human body, um, connecting things to the body, attaching things, um, slicing it. I really love Keetra Dean Dixon as a designer, she does this beautiful layered work. And so I did this thing where I took slices, just horizontal slices. If you take the body and you intersect it with a horizontal line, there's always an even number of intersections. And then I connected those with circles. So basically taking the body and finding where it intersects with the line and putting circles in there and kind of stacking circles, um, doing some weird stuff. Uh, my, my stepdaughter loved this, Popcorn Man. Um, <laughs> Um, this actually, quick, super quickly, I did a project with Margaret Atwood, um, the London Literature Festival, where we took the text of her novel and mapped it on the uh, human body. Um, so you could become characters from this novel, Hagseed. Um, and this is the actual like words from the book, and trying to take three different moments in the book and sort of see what they feel like. Um, and she's awesome. I just want to show, like, she's so, she was so good at this. She told me that if Shakespeare was alive, that he would be using a connect which made me <laughs> super happy. Um, yeah, okay, fast forward. Uh, I show what, okay, I'll show this project and then um, jump, jump into the final thing. Um, this is an installation we did in downtown Houston. It's a beautiful building, um, used to be a department store. Now it's like completely abandoned, it's a parking garage, but it has these great windows. And we designed an installation for the corner for these two windows. Um, inspired by Bruno Minari, he has this a designer has this great book called Design as Art. And in this book, there's all these spreads of, um, of faces. You, and really just showing you that you don't need a lot of information to represent a face, that we see faces in everything. Um, and you, this, there's a concept of paradelia, um, where if you look at something that looks like a face, like an, in America, uh, an electrical socket looks like a face. I guess not in Europe, but... Um, you know, there's a con like seeing faces in things. And this is a museum in Japan of rocks that look like faces. I really want to go there. Uh, <laughs> love this rock. Um, and also for this project, we were really inspired by masks. So we started collecting all of these pictures of masks and masks from different cultures. Masks as a way of, of celebrating and um, exploring like, you know, what's important to a culture. Um, and thinking about different artists like uh, Cyrus K K Kaburu, 
uh, Aaron Worm, like people using the face as a launching point and thinking about extending the face. We did a lot of workshops for kids, so we just went out and hung out with kids in the um, in Houston and built Mass. Um, and then we designed this project. Project is actually using, uh, so usually I use open frameworks. Um, and this is the first project that I did where I used JavaScript. Um, and so the front end for this project is running with a tool called Paper.js, which I really love. If you're a designer, like I love, love, love this tool. It's so super weird. Um, but it's like, feels like Illustrator. It's like coding in JavaScript, but it feels like Illustrator. And the reason that I use Paper.js is I really wanted this very graphical look. So I wanted to create masks that feel like, um, that feel like gra very graphical, very like kind of uh, pure in some way. Um, and the way this installation works is when you approach it, when it finds a face, it zooms in on your face and then um, your face becomes a kind of poster that the graphics live on top of. So it kind of, when it finds your face, just using face tracking, it kind of um, augments and adds a graphical layer on top of your face. And, uh, and I love like, was watching people use it and just love kind of seeing all the stuff that happens with it. Um, this is me saying exactly what I just said to you. But, um, and there's about 50 or 60 of these masks. So every time you look away and you look towards it, you get a different mask. Um, and it's using face tracking, so um, it's like not dissimilar to Snapchat or any of these sorts of things, finding feature points on your face. And then um, really thinking about kind of graphically, like what's a minimal amount of information that we need for something to feel like a face and kind of add that as a layer on top. Um, really exploring kind of, yeah, I don't know, thinking about the Bruno Minari book, like how can uh, different ways of representing a face. Um, recently, been doing a lot of experiments with AR. That's what I'm doing here as part of how, what do you, how do you say this, Rachel? Realities question mark? Is that the name of this program? <laughs> Reality question mark. Reality, this, uh, we're in the middle of, this is, I guess, a four-week program that Chris Agru um, is leading, lead teaching on, um, and it's... Uh, um, Questioning reality. Questioning reality. So, okay, so I, AR, I have been doing AR for a long time in, with my work. Um, but it, this last year, uh, Apple released a tool called ARKit. Um, there's also... Now, Google has a tool called ARCore. Um, I saw a lot of stuff that people were doing over the summer with it, and it, to, to be honest, for me, it was really boring. People just putting 3D models in space, like putting a, like, I don't know, a teapot, a virtual teapot on a table or some kind of boring thing. And if you were to look at that 3D model on its own, it wouldn't be interesting at all. Um, and so at the studio, we were thinking, um, you know, what, What's interesting to us about AR is really, if you know where a device is in space, then we can start to ask interesting questions about it. So what does it mean to have a camera, a screen, a speaker, and a microphone in 3D? And then, then we can ask questions about what, it, like, what is a camera? What is a camera when we know where it is in space? So we started doing these things where our rule for ourselves was like no external content, no 3D models. Really saying like, let's use the device and understand what it feels like to have the device moving in space. So we started with some really basic experiments, just saying like, take a photograph and have the photograph stay where you took it. So when you take a photograph, the photograph sort of floats in the air in the, in the 3D location where you took it. And this moment was like really exciting for us because it, it, it showed us like, okay, there's the power for this thing to be really <coughs> ambiguous. Or we did stuff like take frames of video and leave them in the 3D location where they were taken. And then you could walk through it and replay the video. So using kind of your motion as an interface to scrub through the video and replay the video. And this is, is to be honest, this kind of stuff's not new. There's a company here in Berlin, I think, called Artcom. They have a project from 1995 where they were doing this, you know, called The Shape of Things Past, where they were really exploring video in 3D. But what's exciting to us is like we have it on our phone. We can do it, you know, um, in our hands and go out, you know, to Times Square. This is taking photographs and exploding them in 3D. So it takes a photograph and segments it by color and then pushes those regions in space at different distances away from the camera. So as you move, the image works and um, changes as you move. Or this is taking like a common technique in, in um, you know, kind of creative code world is to do slit scan. So just taking pixels of the video that's in front of you and then dragging that and drawing that in space. Um, more of the same. Um, this is taking photographs and exploding the image away from the camera so that it looks correct from one vantage point. But as you move, you start to see that it's warped. 
Um, we do a lot of weird stuff in the studio. I really like AR as a medium for ambiguity, for creating images that are complex, that ask you to understand, kind of like, a, I guess like an illusion, but that ask you, that force your brain to work a little harder to sort of try to understand what it's looking at. Um, this is recording audio and leaving the audio in space. And then when you walk through, you can replay it. This is a test of talking and seeing what happens when we record audio in space. This is a test of talking and what happens when we record audio in space. Um, and uh, doing a lot of random stuff with uh, typography, taking letter forms, exploiting them out again, thinking about like one vantage point where they look correct, and then having it as you move, it starts to distort. Um, uh, I'll doing a lot of stuff with the face, which is rare. <laughs> okay. uh, I think AR is an interesting medium for storytelling. This is an artist I really love, John Bergerman. He's drawing, um, here he's like telling a story. He says he's drawing the last dinosaur. And so I built a 3D drawing tool where you can draw kind of like a tilt brush, um, very primitive. And he draws a dinosaur, the dinosaur is inside of an egg, the egg is inside of a chicken, the chicken is inside of a pot, the pot, the mom is holding the pot, she's inside of a house. And I just think like it's an interesting medium for storytelling where you can use movement as a way of kind of navigating. Um, recently we made an app, so we have an app in the app store, it's called Weird Type. And this allows you to write messages and then draw. There's um, seven different modes where you can draw with the type in space. And so um, what's exciting for us is that like, we're now trying in the studio um, that I run with my wife, we're now trying to take a lot of the sketches that we're doing and put them in apps for people. So that other people, we're having a lot of fun with this. We want other people to have fun um, with this kind of stuff the way that we've been having fun with it. So, um, one of the things that I find really exciting is like we made this mode called um, Explode, where you put down letters and as you move, they kind of um, they, they animate as you move away from them. Um, and then people do some crazy shit. Like this person figured out if you do a lot of letters, it's almost like a particle system. And people, you know, this person's like drawing with type and doing stuff that I couldn't, even, I didn't even imagine that you could do that with the app. You know, people are figuring out things that you could do. Um, or sometimes like really simple stuff, like even just taking the letter O and dragging it in space and making a tunnel and then running through it. Like I, I had no idea that you could do that. So the exciting thing about making tools is putting them out there and see all the kind of crazy stuff that people do. Um, last thing I want to say is that I do open office hours. So when I, two and a half years ago when I started doing the process of daily sketching, um, I also started doing this thing called open office hours where once a week, um, it's a little bit slower this year because I've had a really hectic travel schedule, but I think this summer I'm gonna go back. It's been maybe like once every couple weeks, but typically it's once a week, and I announce it on Twitter, and I basically make myself available, and I talk to people. When I was an art student at Hunter College, my professor um, in the printmaking studio, he would have open office hours, and the idea is that he would kind of open, would have the door to his office open, and he would spend you know half an hour with us and I, what I loved is that he would take like a lemon poppy seed muffin, he would cut it into slices and like give us a slice, and he would just listen. And we were like an 18 year old, you know, talking about art, and he would just listen and take us seriously and talk to us and give us ideas and just be there. And I found that this process like to be really valuable. So um, I do this, oh look, this is Rachel. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Rachel again. Um, I do this where, uh, you know, I, I talk to people um, online, I talk to people in person, um, and I've been doing this for two and a half years now. And I find it really valuable that um, daily sketching is a way of sort of saying hello to the world and open office hours is a way of listening and trying to listen to the world. Um, the last thing that I want to say, this is a book. Um, so my um, stepdaughter, uh, she's eight now, but she was six at the time when she wrote this book. I'm going to read it to you because she explains art better than um, I could or anybody could. Um, so I'm going to read a book called I Am Art. I have to find it. Uh, I Am Art. Um, by 
Ruben's an artist. She really wanted me to tell you that she was six when she made this. <laughs> I'm, and I do this now, like, I, you know, I've been using this in my talks now for like a year and a half. I'm like waiting for I Mark too. But I love, this book is so amazing. I think I, think I will read this book forever. Um, I Am Mark by Ruben the Artist. Uh, this book is for Apo and Agana Nana Art. Art is like you feel free, you feel like you can do anything, and you know what to draw. And if you don't, you look at you. You are the one, and you have your own imagination. And maybe in your imagination you will see lines and squares. This. <laughs> <laughs> and in those squares and lines you will see art. And that art is amazing, and you are too. Haha, -ha, art, hello. Stop looking at me, ah. Uh. Art, 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 I am art, art, food is art, art, anything is art, 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 art,